Good afternoon, Grade 11s. Welcome to your first telematics session. This afternoon, we would just like to dedicate this show to two of our colleagues, which is Gary Voges and Gavin Manuel. And for you that's tuning in for the first time, Grade 11s, we would like you to SMS and say hi. The number is 31498. And let's go over to my colleague. Hello, Ross. Hi, Amanda. Okay, so I think uh, this will be the first time a lot of them are actually meeting us. So just to introduce ourselves, I'm Ross Milam. This is uh, Amanda Juries. We have been doing this program with Matrix for quite, I think, the whole year now. So this will be the first time we're meeting you. And um, our whole purpose is to try and summarize a whole section and just get as much information into your brain as possible so that you can do your best when it comes to matric. Okay, so we're gonna be doing a human resource function today. It's one of, it's both of our favorites. <laughs> we were just talking about it beforehand. So human resources function, first of all, I'm gonna give you a nice overview. Um, I like doing this, so you hopefully get used to it. It's just so that you can actually see what everything and how it all comes into the picture. So we're gonna be talking about a job description, a job specification, what are they, why are they necessary, etc. We're going to talk about in recruitment. That's now getting people to come to our company or where are we getting them from, um, internal and external. We're going to be talking about selection and interview. And we're going to be talking about placement. That's like, where am I going to put you in my company? We're going to talk about an employment contract. That's the agreement I have between myself as the employer and my employee, the person working for me. We talk about the payday that I like to call it how we pay you. Um, we talk about induction, um, employee benefits, and we also talk about compulsory benefits such as insurance. Um, other things we talk about is induction, that's introducing you to the company, that shows that the company loves you, it wants to make you a part of them, and we talk about legislation. Legislation is laws, laws that are specific to South Africa that relate to the workplace, um, such as the BCA, LRA, and all of those many acronyms that we're going to get you familiar with um, as we go along. We're also going to talk about strikes. Strikes are when the workforce decides, look, we're upset, we need to show you we're upset. Um, and we're going to talk a, quite a bit around that, both are they legal or are they illegal? Are they protected or are they unprotected? Okay, so that's the overview. That's what we're going to be talking about today. Human resources, how do we take care of the human component of our company? Okay, so um, let's get started. First of all, Amanda, we've got the actual definition, if you don't mind. Okay, but before I do that, let me just greet Sarepta signing in. Welcome, Sarepta High School, to today's program. And then we have Kwezi Lomso. Welcome, Kwezi. Any other grade 11s out there, feel free, send us the SMS. The number is... 31498. Okay, let us, let's see. We're doing human resources. Your definition here is it's the division of the company that is focused on activates related to employees. So your human resources got to do the resources. Resource is something that you have and we're looking at our humans. And we're focusing on the hiring, which is another word for recruitment. Hiring, which is the termination of a contract. We're going to be looking at training. Orientation is part of induction where we introduce our new employees to the company. And we're going to look at happiness. Many of you are probably familiar with the term wellness. How, what's the morale of, the, of our workers in the company like? And Russ is putting a little quote that says, builds and runs the human engine in the company. And remember what they say, a happy worker is a productive worker. And our first step that we're going to look at is our job description and our job specification. This is in essence the first step when it comes to recruitment. Before we can go out and look for someone to work for us, we need to analyze the job and see what type of person or what type of position are we looking for. So the first thing we look at is your job description and that will tell us the duties. What will you do? 
if it's an accountant, we expect the person to draw up the cash book, we want them to draw up the ledger accounts, we would like them to do the control accounts, we would like them to draw up the financial statements. What is their responsibilities? What are they in charge of? And then alternatively, you have your job specification, and here we specify what type of skills do the person that we are recruiting need? We need them to have a PCOM degree. We need them to be computer literate. Then we also emphasize what knowledge we would have the person to, to have. Okay, I'm going to take this one. Um, before you even do all of this, you have to decide, first of all, where am I going to recruit? Where am I going to get or where am I going to find my human component? Now, we're going to teach you about two of them. One is internal. That would be I'm looking inside of my company. So the little yellow circle, um, I'm looking at them. I'm looking at the people who already work for me. And then the other one is obviously external. Outside of the blue circle, people who have nothing to do with me at the moment, they're external to my company. They perhaps work for another company or they're looking for a job or just graduated. They're outside of my company. Now, there are benefits to either one. Um, just to mention some, when I promote within my company, when I say, hey, look, um, John, you've done a really good job. I'd like to promote you. He is not only happy, but it shows the rest of my workforce that there's something to work towards. So it's a nice motivational tool. So as a manager, I need to think about that. The other one is now if I'm sitting in my company and maybe I don't have the skills that I require for a certain job, I look elsewhere. I look outside my company. And so I hire externally. Okay, so understand if it's internal, it's inside my company. If I'm going to go look outside, it's external recruitment. It's just where am I getting my workers from at the end of the day. Okay, so we're going to move on to the next slide, I think. Okay, so now we've got the selection process. One was recruitment, now this is selection. So I'm going to run through each one of these with you um, so that you can be familiar with it. Because a lot of questions actually ask you what are the steps. Okay, so I made it as colorful for you and as flowing as possible. We're going to talk about each one of these. The first step is now obviously I have um, got all these CVs. People have said, right, I've decided it's either internal or external and I've advertised the job and now CVs are coming in. CVs are those documents with all the details um, that are required from each person to see are they suitable for my job, like um, their qualifications. Um, where they've worked, their name, their details, so that I can actually look at them. So the CV is the first step. I look at it and I start screening. Because now Amanda mentioned earlier we have job description, we have job spec um, specifications. People do try their luck. They send in CVs, but if they do not match what I'm looking for, I start screening. So in those old gold prospectors, they screen. They're looking for the gold. That's the same thing we're doing here. We don't want to interview everyone. We're looking for specific candidates who meet our requirements as a company. Okay, so that's the first step. I'm screening for candidates. Once I've gone through all the CVs, I shortlist. Only the best need to get through to me. I do not need to see everybody. I only want to see who I think are potential candidates for my company. So the best of the best at the end of the day. We call it a shortlist because it has to be short. We're not talking hundreds here, we're talking 10, 15, maybe. It has to be a short list. Remember, each person you're interviewing is costing you time and it's costing you money because now your HR consultants have to interview them, they have to sit there and ask them questions. So we don't wanna waste time, we only want the best. Okay, so that's the second step, that's a short list. The next step is um, inform the, the people on the list. Hey, look, um, you're on the list, come in for an interview, and then, of course, have the interview. Now, the interview has a lot around it. We're going to talk a little bit about it uh, later on. Um, but that's where I get to meet. That's where I get to see the person that I'm actually talking to. And it's a great... A lot of people say, oh, I don't need to. I can just look at a piece of paper. But a lot of companies want to meet you. That's why we say dress formally, be presentable, and have to convey your best um, persona forward. Okay, so the interview is crucial at the end of the day. Okay, so that's the step. And after I've interviewed you, me as a company, I want to do a little bit more. So nowadays, um, be, 
people have qualifications, but I still want to test. I want to assess um, a few things. So I'm allowed to do that. I can go, look, um, please, I would like you to have a, a test. If you're an engineer, you can answer all these questions for me, please. And um, if you're very good at your job, that would be very simple. A, a tests whether you are qualified properly and able to do the job. B, it gives me a very good idea of where you are in terms of maybe there are three or four candidates for the job and maybe your test scores aren't so high. So it's an assessment tool. It helps me make my decision at the end of the day. So I'm assessing you. Okay, so that's the next step. After that, after I've got all of that information, I still need to check. I need to contact references. Um, so obviously you've done it in life orientation or hopefully a business teacher has chatted to you about it. You give references, people who I can contact and check details about you. That's very important. I need to also do background checks, make sure you've got qualifications. I think, Amanda, in, I think in this country there has been a problem with saying I've got a qualification but don't actually have <laughs> it, which is very much not allowed. Okay, so companies are doing it. They're checking on you. They want to see, okay, you say you have a BCom, I'm, I'm going to go look. And if they can't find it, and if you don't have one, that's going to land you in a very big uh, load of trouble, I think. <laughs> okay, the last step. After I've done all of this, I've got everything I need. I've met you. I've tested you. I've checked your references. I'm happy. I choose and notify the person, hey, congratulations, you have the job. Okay, so very standard. If you think about it, it makes sense. It's a logical process. Um, you as learners need to know the steps, and you need to know them in order because it makes no sense having an interview before I've actually got CVs. So think about it. Okay, so we're going to move on now. So that's the selection process. All right, Amanda. Okay, we're looking at the interview process, grade 11. But before I do that, a special welcome to new audience in Paul. Thank you for tuning in this afternoon. So we're going to be looking at why do we interview people? You need to find out if this is the right person for the job. You, they need to ask and check information of the job seeker and also allow the job seeker to ask questions. But I believe that um, there should be something on your CV that stands out that makes the interviewer also want to shortlist you. I mean, once they, they look through hundreds of, of application forms of hundreds of CVs, something on your CV must just stand out. And it's probably on one of those things that they are going to question you. And grade 11, this is the right time for you to be drawing up a CV as well. We're also going to look at the role of the employer during the interview and the role of the job seeker. The person that's interviewing you, there's certain things that they need to put into place. For example, they need the person that's interviewing you. There's certain things that they would need to put into place. For example, they need to contact everybody that's going to come in for the interview. They need to set up a venue where the interview will take place. They need to set up the questions that they're going to ask you. And if it's a panel interview, they obviously need to get the set up a time that everybody on the panel is available so that the interview can take place. What is your role as a job seeker? I think, um, and especially here, Google is our friend. We need to Google the company. You need to uh, find out something about the company so that you know what is the ethos of the company, what they do, what they, you know, uh, what countries they're operating. So just basically know something of the company. I think most first questions any company asks is, so have you, do you know anything about us, our, our company? So that's a standard question a lot of interviewees actually, interviewers give. They want you to, they want to see, have you looked at whether you would fit into a company? It's actually, I think it's a discourtesy not to actually find out information about the company. It's your way of saying, I'm interested, I yes. want to be here. Exactly. I fit in here because you need to make an impression and tell the people, I fit into your company because I have the same vision that you people have. Mm -hmm. Interesting, <coughs> eh? But all that I can tell you, interviews can be nerve-wracking. I don't think I want to be going through mm. any of those. Uh, interviews are very important, I think, for company. 
I've been on both sides of the table. Okay. And um, learners, you need to literally, to be comfortable, you need to be honest. So that's why we always say, be honest, be straightforward. Questions are questions, and you must just go with it. And yeah. ironically, they say the person that interviews you decides the first 20 seconds when you walk into the room mm. if they are going to hire you, which means it's not only, I mean, obviously they've read your CV, but it's also the way you conduct yourself, the way you carry yourself, your confidence, the body language, and that, that will make that final impression. Yes, it's very crucial. That's why smart suits. Um, I think my impression in the past has been affected by not dressing correctly. It does put a very damper on your initial impression of the candidate. So, something you need to think about. Is that the only time you wear suits? No, <laughs> all the time. Okay, so we're going to go on to placement. After I've interviewed um, you and everything else, and everything's gone super well, I'm going to place. Placement, as I've written down on the slide, is the process of placing an employee in a vacant position in the company. Okay, it's very crucial. If you see my little, little picture there, people are important. They're a puzzle piece that I need to place in the right place. Okay, so placement, put you where I need you. You're successful, cool. I've got a position for you, I'm placing you there, you fit the role, you fit the puzzle piece, everything is strong. Okay, so that's placement, it's very straightforward. The next one that we're gonna go into, Amanda, okay, is induction. I feel this is a very important process in any company. This has to be where you actually try and make your worker from meeting them and getting them productive. So the purpose uh, is that the, the worker needs to explain and know the company. What are my rules as a company? Um, what am I doing? What are the products I have? What are the services? This is our company. This is how we view things. As Miranda uh, mentioned, what's our vision? What's our mission? You need to explain this to every employee. Okay, maybe you're one of those very good employees and you researched it, but they know, got to make sure that you know it. And especially, uh, policy. Policies change from company to company. So some companies say this is okay while others say it's not okay. So it's very important. From their point of view they want to say these are the rules. Like a school, these are the school rules. You break the rules, there's going to be consequences. So they're making sure they explain the rules to you so that you can't come back later and say I didn't know. They're covering themselves and they're also making sure you know. The benefits of this induction process. I'll give you an example. If Jane now approaches a company and they don't tell her anything, she won't know where the copy machine is, she won't know who the HR manager is, so how long is it going to take her to go to her fellow colleagues and say, sorry, uh, where's the copy machine? It's going to take long, it's not very efficient. So by showing her around, by telling her all the necessary information, we're doing a few things. We're making her effective in our whole workplace. Okay, so just back to the slide. Um, the benefits, it increases motivation because I feel comfortable in my company. The quality of work's better because now you know what is expected of you and what's standard, and the worker becomes productive much quicker. And lastly, it ensures all rules are followed. That's the benefit. Of induction, please, this is my company. I introduce you to them. And you're all good. Okay, so it's that, so you're nice and comfortable. They know you know what their position is and you know what to expect from them and what to give them back. Okay, it's a nice meeting at the end of the day. Induction. Okay. And I think induction is a guaranteed question for the end of the year paper. Yeah, I see. Either in section B at question five or it could be part of your recruitment essay. And I think in grade 11 that... Um, since HR is one of the, the topics that you take to grade 12, this could be a definite question at the end of the year, grade 11, so you need to prepare yourself very well around this topic. Precisely. Okay. All right, Amanda, I'm going to take training because I quite enjoy training. Um, now, training does happen in some companies. I'm going to give you some examples. Training, at the end of the day, you hire, for instance, a matric. Now, a lot of you... I'm going to be there in a few, in a year, hopefully, that you're going to be in a few months. Yeah. And um, after that, you're going to go into the working world. Now, a lot of companies don't require you to have all of these skills in the future. They need you to be a worker, and they are going to give you skills. They are going to train you, because maybe they want you to do something their way. 
So training can happen in the company, but there's a few things around that. A, it costs a bit of money, so they've got to have a lot of faith in you, and B, it takes time. Okay, so we're just going to go through some points quickly in training on the slide. So one, I'm developing new skills and knowledge. Um, it is an investment, like I mentioned. It does develop the needs of the workers need to be understood. What do I need from my workers? And we are going to just talk about CETAs in terms of laws in the, the Skills Development Act later on. And when I've trained you, you're doing it my way, and hopefully my way is the best way. I'm increasing efficiency. Okay, so if I'm giving you skills, I'm making you better, I'm actually making sure that the skills you know fits my workplace, and I make you efficient, and I make you productive very quickly. But remember, it's investing. I'm sending you somewhere to get trained. So I have heard in the past, if candidates don't complete these trainings, you might be in a bit of trouble. So when accepting a position with training, you need to understand how important it is to complete it, and often there's a work back agreement, but that's a little bit higher grade for now. Okay, so CETAs, Sector Education Training Authorities, I think we'll talk a bit, a bit more about that in the Skills Development Act, but training, very important. I as a company can train you, and I will, and most companies, if they're smart, will invest in future trainings to keep their workforce efficient. Okay. Now, Amanda? Okay, our next section, grade 11, is the employment contracts. A definition here for you. It's an oral or written agreement specifying the terms and conditions under which a person consents to perform certain duty as directed and controlled by an employer in return for an agreed wage or salary. But let us just define that in layman's terms. So your employment contract is, could be an oral agreement. It would preferably be in writing so that you safeguard it. The agreement is between the employer and the employee. And obviously you do duties and your employer will agree to pay you for the duties that you do. From a legality point of view, the contract must be signed. So the employee and the employer must sign the contract normally on your first day of arrival at the company. The contract will be signed and this contract is binding on both the employee as well as the employer. And the law requires that a contract is presented to the employee when they start it. And I mean that is also covered in the Basic Conditions of Employment Act. And the labor law distinguish between a permanent employer, a temporary employee, and a part-time employee. Let's see what goes into the employment contract. I actually like this question to be asked because this is such a nice question, it's just a common sense question. Firstly, you need to put in the name of your employee, the name of the employer, the address of the employee, the address of the employer, the job description, exactly what are you going to be doing, your job title, your working hours agreed upon, your leave conditions, and your leave conditions is normally very specified, your sick leave, your study leave, whatever the leave entails, your salary package. They also have a termination uh, conditions as well, when will the contract be terminated? Some contracts are a fixed contract where you work just for a month, 12 months period. After 12 months, the contract will come to an end. Often they would have in your contract also a probation period, which is a period that you, that you normally work a trial period where they can assess how well are you working. If they are impressed with you and then they can offer you a fixed contract. And then it's your starting date as well. And for me, this is such a nice section B question, you know, something that is um, either in, in question five or question six. All right. Now, apart from uh, your employment contract, which contains all those details, that's why it's written out, so there's no misunderstandings when it comes to um, what the company expects from you and what you expect from the company, um, you get payday. That's the whole point of working at the end of the day. You need a salary to live. So... We talk about a salary, what you will earn, personal tax, that is the, the portion that you owe to government, be it pay as you earn. 
You've also got benefits. I call that the extra cake for you. A lot of companies try and give you a little bit more of incentive, car allowances, cell phone allowances, housing allowances. They're trying to maybe bring workers across to their company. So they give a little bit more. Now, why they do this has to do with tax implications, etc. But it's so they can attract workers and also motivate them so that they feel appreciated by the company. Okay, so Amanda, let's go to the next slide. So I'm three. looking at the way you say payday, and I think this is the best day of the, the month. You know, when that SMS comes through mm -hmm. to say the salad he has been deposited into your account, you know, I think that's the best peep that the phone makes ever. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so now, salary. Now, companies want to pay you in two different ways. I've put a nice little um, a table together here for you. You get two ways, piecemeal, time-related. Piecemeal is not, has nothing to do with lunch. <laughs> it has nothing to do with that. It has to do with how you get paid. So instead of getting paid per hour, like time, you're getting paid per product. I make a computer. They will pay you for making one computer. If you make one computer in one hour or four hours, you only get paid for the one computer. But in certain factories where maybe they can do a job very quickly, they can make six or seven articles much quicker so they might it incentivizes your workers to go right i can earn more i'm going to make more but they often have quality checks to make sure that it's the right standard but that worker has the potential to earn more so it's a very motivating tool for a lot of companies especially when they're sitting there and when you take it against time related it definitely is motivating for products but some companies will only pay you for the number of hours that you worked so that's the other way time related payment okay so Piecemeal, paid for the amount of work, increases the amount of work done, quality of the product may be bad, that's why you've got to do quality checks, and time related is for the number of hours. But that's why we have supervisors and managers, they need to make sure you work during those hours. Okay, and then what's great about it is I know how much I'm going to get every month, regardless. See, the other one, it's not always set, and it might be less, it might be more. And But the worker can always work extra time. So each one has a benefit, each one has a negative, and it's up to you as a company to decide what's going to work for you. All right, so that's the two ways that we get paid. Piecemeal, nothing to do with lunch, it has to do with per piece, and time related, I get paid for the number of hours I work. Okay, those two only. So that's the salary component. And if we go to the next one, personal tax. Now all of us as uh, working adults, you as future working adults have to get used to this. There are two that you're going to be paying. Site has fallen away, and now it's just pay as you earn. That is the tax by the government on your salary, and it so it goes to building networks. That's our infrastructure of our of our country. So it is very important, and it's compulsory. It's a compulsory deduction from your salary as an employee. Okay, so you earn more, you potentially pay more at the end of the day. Earn more. Pay more. So it's kind of, it is a fair system and it has worked and it is still working. So be prepared for that. That is what comes off your salary. And if we go to the next one, Amanda. You know, Ross, I don't mind paying tax, but I don't like paying tax on overtime. Because mm. I think this is an additional work that you're putting in. I think tax, <laughs> I believe overtime shouldn't be taxed on the same rate. Maybe a reduced rate because this shows initiative on your part. You know, working extra hours and um, providing or adding to the GDP. Maybe one day, but not <laughs> today. <laughs> All right, so we've also got um, terminating. Um, how do we terminate you as a worker? There are four different ways. Now, all of them aren't as bad as they sound. Um, when I resign, it's a resignation. This is where the employee chooses to leave. We have a dismissal. This is not the nice one. This is where I ask you to leave, or more likely, more precisely, I tell you to leave. And then retirement, this is when you reach the age of retirement and you can go rest. Okay, this is off must usually when you actually have enough savings um, to actually support your retirement. The next one is quite common in South Africa is retrenchment. Um, this is structural retrenchment. Company is forced to ask you to change or leave their position. The company's changing. It might be that they're getting smaller or they're restructuring, but your job is changing. So maybe. They don't need six um, salespeople, they only need four because they're getting smaller. So what do they do with the other two? They retrench them. 
Now, retrenching is saying, right, you're working for us. There's nothing wrong with what you're doing, um, but you need to go. Um, so what we do is they give you a retrenchment package to say, okay, this is what we're going to give you to terminate your contract in a nice way. It's part of the way companies need to work. And later on in matric, you're going to learn all about it in terms of a business strategy to defend your core business. If things don't always go well, I need to defend it, so I might need to retrench some workers to keep my core business alive. So, four different ways that we can terminate a contract. You resign, you get dismissed, you retire, go relax on an island, or if I'm changing my company structure, I retrench. Four different ways. The one with the retrenchment is actually going to be very topical now with the merger of SAB and the Miller Brewery companies. So I think at the back of everybody's mind, working for SAB is going to be... Quite concerned. Are they going to have retrenchment taking place? Okay. So these are the four acts. Now, um, a lot of the matrix that uh, are when they first term, they go through legislation. You're going to be going through this, but we're going to introduce you to these four acts. These are all the acts or laws that are very applicable to human resources. And they come in the form of acronyms, and then we expand upon them. So get used to both of them, acronyms and the proper full written art legislation. So SDA is Skills Development Act. LRA is Labor Relations Act. BCEA is Basic Conditions of Employment Act. And EEA is the Employment Equity Act. Four different acts, four different ways they affect business. You need to know them. Okay, so I'm going to take you through this one. This is the Labor Relations Act. I like to call it the Labor Relationship Act. It has to do with how we, as a company, deal with our employees and how they obviously either deal with their relationship back on us. Okay, it ensures fairness because it's set out rules and it applies to both the employer and employee because in the past it used to be very much the company could do what they wanted and the employee suffered. So this is a very important law for companies. Okay, it's a fair process for both hiring and firing is in the Act. Um, there are rights of trade unions are protected, so trade unions are allowed to form, they're allowed to operate, they're allowed to deduct union fees, and you as a company need to be aware of it. Um, there's also a process for strikes and disputes, and it does encourage worker participation both in workplace forums, trade unions, and just a healthy relationship in general with the company. Okay, so it's very important at the end of the day. Okay, Amanda, if you don't mind taking that one. Oh, this is one of my favorite <laughs> acts, the basic conditions of the Employment Act. It protects employees against unfair labor practice, practices. And here, one of the rules is that all businesses should uh, display the basic conditions of Employment Act. In many cases, if you go to the bathroom or the canteen of many businesses, you will actually see the basic conditions of employment, you know, at the back of the door or against the wall. And, you know, this is something we need to know exceptionally well. We work 45 hours a week. That is the maximum amount of time a person can work a week. So for a five-day week, it will be nine hours and if you work in a six day week it's going to be eight hours you are allowed to work overtime three hours per day to a maximum of 10 hours per week your maternity benefits if a lady is having a on accoutrement you are allowed four months of maternity leave Remember the grade 11s, this is the minimum conditions. There are many companies that extend this four months. I know Pick and Pay has a maternity leave of six months. Then you will have 21 days annual leave, and that 21 days need to be consecutive days. That means after each other. You can't take a week in March and a week in November and a week in next year, February. It should be 21 consecutive days so that you can be rested when you go back to work. Your sick leave, 30 days paid sick leave in the three-year cycle. 
and you are entitled to one hour lunch for, for every five hours worked. So if you've been working for five hours, you are entitled to a one hour lunch break. These minimum rules are very important because your employment contract that we spoke about earlier is normally based on these rules that are set out in the Basic Conditions of Employment Act. Okay. Our next act we're going to look at is I'll do the Employment Equity Act because Ross will do the skills development with you. Now your Employment Equity Act says equal opportunity. It will eliminate unfair discrimination and they also looked at affirmative action. Now the Employment Equity Act, this act specifically, is to redress the imbalances of the past. Because normally they ask you what is the purpose of the Employment Equity Act. So yes, South Africa, we know the history. So yes, in after 94, we inherited a lot of baggage of the past. And one way to redress is the Employment Equity Act where we say everybody gets an equal opportunity. Nobody will be discriminated at, and particularly those that were previously disadvantaged especially the women, those that were black, colored, or Indian, and even those that were differently abled were all disadvantaged. So all these particular people will now be given an equal opportunity. So they will be, and we also, that's where we practice inclusivity and we also promote diversity. Let's look at what the impact on HR will be. So our impact on HR will be the jobs must be made known to all. By letting everybody know about the job, we're giving everybody an equal opportunity. No unfair discrimination. Uh, we will not place in the advert that we're looking for a black male or we're looking for a white lady. So there'll be no unfair discrimination. You place the ad in, everybody that, um, everybody that applies, we, we know everybody's given a fair chance. Fair testing and assessment. We will identify employees for affirmative action. And I think this is particularly also done in terms of internal recruitment, especially for promotion positions as well. An employment equity plan as a code of good practice. And also, if you're in grade 12, you would have known that the Employment Equity Act is one of the pillars or broad-based black economic empowerment. And since Ross likes training, he will hmm. do the Skills Development Act. Yes, all right. Now, in Skills Development, um, as Amanda mentioned, because of imbalances of the past, because of the education system wasn't so strong, this came along to try again to now bolster our workforce. Saying, right, we know there's a skills shortage or skills problem, skills challenge, however you'd like to view it, um, we need to fix it. So the Skills Development Act came, came along saying, right, we are going to do the following. We are going to set up specific centers, and each of those centers are in sectors that need skills, and we're going to develop these centers to be very specific to each sector, give them the skills that they need just to work in that sector, make them more proficient, make them more skilled, more developed. Okay, so these specific sectors or specific training centers, um, you could think of them, are called CETAs, Sector Education Training Authorities. They get funded by the skills development levy that is placed on a company, and they pay for you, and the company then can claim back from that when they send their workers to go work for them. Okay, so on the slide I'd like to show you, um, provides the structure to ensure training in South Africa. Um, it's sector education, as I've showed you, there are 23 sectors. I've given you some examples if you'd like to go look at them um, so that you can know for yourself. There are some impacts on human resources that we need to know about. Um, you have to know what needs to be trained. So a lot of companies need to keep seeing, where is my workforce at the moment? Um, what do I need to train them in? What uh, centers can I send them to that are accredited by the specific CETA? Um, that's very important. You can't send them anywhere. They need to be accredited by the specific CETA. Say, for instance, the bank CETA. If I'm sending a bank teller for maybe... Um, accounting training, they have to be at a specific training center that is accredited, not just the one around the corner that is the cheapest, it has to be accredited. 
Um, so it's very important as me as HR, I need to make sure all of that is in line with the legislation. A skills development levy has to be deducted by a finance department. It needs to be paid over, that's very important. And we as a company, if we're smart, can actually, instead of looking at it negatively, look at it positively. Money is being paid over, but if I take my workers and I send them to the actual training, I can claim it back saying, look, my workforce has gone for training. I get that some of that money back, it's not all of it. And on top of that, my workers are now more trained and they're better, making my company better and more efficient. So all in all, it's a very clever piece of legislation because it helps everyone. Company gets better, worker gets better, and obviously country can get better at the end of the day. Um, the other thing that does impact the skills has to be relevant to the sector. There's no point sending someone who works in the food and beverage for computer training. It has to be relevant at the end of the day. But CETAs handle that at the end of the day. They try and make sure that the skills are relevant to each and every sector in their planning. Okay, so that's the Skills Development Act. Very important to most big companies nowadays. And the next one I'm going to talk about. Now, this is one of my favorite strikes. <laughs> now, there are two words. We are quite familiar in South Africa with strikes, and you as learners are quite familiar with them. If you're in Cape Town or even abroad, you're there. it's in the news almost all the time. We define two types. One is legal, as in it's procedural, means that it was done correctly, done by the book, and what we call illegal or unprocedural, done without notice. Now, we have quite the bad habit of having a lot of illegal strikes, which is a bit of a no-no against the Labor, um, Labor Relations Act. It doesn't form a nice relationship, so it's unprotected. So what happens if one is legal or illegal? Well, if it's legal, I can't dismiss you. I, as a company, was informed that you're having a strike and no problem. But you're not working, so I don't have to pay you. But I can't dismiss you. So that's the nice thing. I protect you. You told me about the strike. It's all legal. And off you go. Have your strike and come back when we've resolved our issues. And what most people don't know is that you actually have to first have meetings before you go to a strike. Is normally a little bit down the process. It's not your first option. There's first discussion, there's meetings, and the unions and the employer come together. This is what we want. Can we help? And, but if they still can't come to a resolution, then the strike comes in as a, a measure to display the unhappiness at the end of the day. So that's a legal strike. It's procedural, done by the book. The illegal one, I can dismiss you if misconduct is serious. So you're not protected at the end of the day. Again, both are no work, no pay. If you're not working, I, I, I as a company cannot be forced to pay you. That's unfair for me because then at the end of the day, everyone will strike all the time and my company will crash and burn, which we don't want. The country doesn't want that. They want the companies just to be aware that workers are allowed to demonstrate their unhappiness. So a strike. But at the end of the day, I don't have to pay you. So workers, when they want to go on strike, have to make a very, they have to think about it quite a bit. The trade union has to be sure that's what they want to do okay so that's strikes if you go to the next one I'm pretty sure it's um, our fringe benefits um, at the end of the day this was mentioned earlier I think the slide jumped but we have four different fringe benefits now, earlier I mentioned in the salary package we have salary and a tax gets deducted and we have fringe benefits I've just shown a few here um, medical aid pension provident fund and other allowances. Medical aid, often companies to attract workers will say we'll pay some of the medical aid. Um, pension, companies will contribute towards that um, because it's tax deductible and all the rest of it. Um, provident fund is very similar to a pension. It's just a different way of saving for retirement. And allowances, extra pay towards your working costs because, for instance, a person who's a salesperson has a car they have a cell phone and that money might come out of their pocket so to protect them and to motivate them I give them allowances so that it doesn't come out of their pocket they can actually feel like their salary is theirs at the end of the month so when that SMS comes through Amanda I'm not feeling <laughs> like all my money is going to it, everything else except to me remember it's a compensation for my hard work at the end of the day okay so those are fringe benefits extra benefits to my salary 
Yeah. That is why so many just teachers get laptops. Oh, I certainly haven't got that fringe benefit yet. Oh, me neither, <laughs> but I'm looking forward to having one. Okay, I think these are other compulsory benefits. Amanda did mention it in the Basic Conditions of Employment Act. And um, this is something that human resources need to be aware of. Maternity happens, and they're entitled to it. You can't say no. Um, vacation happens. That is part of working. I need time to rest. Adoption leave and sick leave. And just to make sure you understand, it's in a three-year cycle. That means that it, it changes every three years. It gets topped up. So if you use it within one month of that three years, you don't get extra. That's it. Your sick leave is used. You, that's why people think sick leave is like an extra holiday, but it's not. You've got to use it only when you're sick. The company gives it to you. They pay you for it. But if it's misused, there can be problems around the table. That's the, the bargaining table. I actually find it very fascinating that your adoption leave is the exact same amount of time as maternity leave. <laughs> So if you adopt a baby like a lady, you would get four months maternity leave. You would get four months of time with your baby that you adopt as well. They're even discussing um, now fathers getting paternity leave. paternity leave one day. I know in Norway and Sweden, the men get six months oh, yeah. paternity leave. And then we also got family responsibility um, for things like um, funerals or those emergency times that children are sick. Those are days that are also given by a company. And you also get paid public holidays. That is also quite nice in South Africa. We have a lot of public holidays. That does work out for a lot of the workers. And um, if they do work on those days, they either get paid or they get the time back later. So the company is always thinking of themselves and you. It's got to be a relationship. It has to be a relationship. And then I know that to you, many companies, especially those companies that allow you, you know, we, we training is big. And they mm. want you to go study further. They offer very good study leave packages as well. Yes. I think for every subject you get two days off, as well as um, That's even trade union duties and that. It's all motivation. We have to keep our workers happy. They're our engine. We've got to find ways to keep them happy. Okay. Okay, these are the two compulsory insurances that we're going to quickly go over. Um, we haven't got much time. So the one is Unemployment Insurance Fund. And the other is COIDA, which is Compensation for Occupational Injuries and Disease Act. Unemployment, if I become unemployed, there is a fund that helps me through those tough times. That is UIF. The other one is COIDA. If I get hurt on the job or injured or contract a disease on the job, I can claim from this fund to help you with my medical expenses and my expenses. This is so that our workers are protected in those times they're not working and also from the conditions they might be in in their job. Okay, so those two are compulsory. Companies have to pay for them. Ross, we just need to say with UIF, it's only if you have contributed to the unemployment insurance funds before. Very true. So it means there must have been a time that you have worked and have contributed to the fund. Only then when you are unemployed, you can claim from the fund. So our matriculants that finish on the... The end of November month, they'll be unemployed, but they will not be able to claim from the fund as they have not worked in the past. Yes, exactly. Okay, so these are all advantages. I encourage you to read over them. Boost material, uh, morale. There's, it helps attract good workers. High risk cover for low costs. It proves efficiency. And premiums are tax deductible. It's all just benefits. So companies will use fringe benefits if they can. And you, as a future business owner, should be looking at these to motivate workers and help your company grow at the end of the day. So I encourage you to, work, to read over these. <coughs> so Amanda, just go to the next one. Um, these are the disadvantages. It does reduce profitability. There is time spent on administration. It is an effort on ensuring that um, everything meets the laws. And the company has to cover the cost. So they are sort of there are disadvantages but you as a company have to decide whether the advantages outweigh those that are disadvantage or disadvantages of fringe benefits and that's everything i encourage you to go through everything as you can see from the overview we've gone through a lot um, in this session we also have some questions that were on this as well go through those um, the actual human resources content is very important as amanda's mentioned it goes on to matric 
and they want to make sure you know it because it is very important to you as business study learners to know the impact of the laws, what all of this means as to a company as a human resources component. And grade 12, or actually the grade 11, grade sorry 11s. about that, grade 11s, as this is your first session, I encourage you, our telematrix videos will be uploaded onto YouTube in the next day or two, so I would suggest that you, www, <laughs> you go onto YouTube and then you search for telematics. Okay, telematics business studies, and there you will see a variety of um, our previous sessions as well. You will see human resource on there. You will see team building because I know the grade 11s, uh, team building is one of the topics for the year as well. There is creativity. There is others is on the various act, but I'm sure the one on team building, creativity, and HR will be able to help you for your upcoming exams. And the teachers in the Western Cape all have access to the PowerPoints. So ask your teacher to make a copy available to you. Yes. Okay, so that's very important, learners. You need to, there are resources available to you. Um, and ask your teacher if you're missing anything, they can help you with the PowerPoints, the core notes that are going to come through, um, all of those sort of things. And I encourage you also, if next time you can send us questions. Um, we had quite a few in the past, and we do our best to answer them with you. Um, but we can't always get to everything, so we just try and select the questions that we think everyone um, will like to hear the answer to. So next time, SMS us some questions. We're quite interested in that. We've added questions to our content as well. Um, I'm not sure how much time we've got you left. Okay. All right, so we're just going to say bye. Great elevens, I hope you have a good year in matric and we look forward to seeing you next time. Best luck for your upcoming exams, grade elevens, all of the best. We want to see you all in grade twelve and twenty sixteen. Thank you. Bye.